you ever had a hangnail? You know that one little piece of your fingernail that no matter what you do, you, you nibble on it, you bite on it, you rub on it, you clip on it. But no matter what you do, it catches on everything. It catches when you put on your shirt sleeves. It, it catches when you button your jacket and ah, snags in that little buttonhole. You pull on your socks and it's caught in your socks. You try to scratch yourself. You're like, oh, there's like three other people scratching me. Because that hangnail, that little, that just a little piece of something sticking up, it catches on everything. And sometimes we get a, maybe a sticker, like a grasper if you're in Texas, or a thistle if you're somewhere in the woods. Maybe a thorn from a rose bush pokes a hole in the skin, and once it breaks the skin, infection starts to get in there. And if it's not dealt with, that, that little bit of infection, eventually it can cost you a limb. I mean, literally, it could eventually get enough infection that it goes beyond the tip of your finger and into your whole finger and then into your whole hand and then gets into your bloodstream and starts traveling all throughout your body. And that kind of infection can ultimately, if not deal, dealt with, stop your heart. I mean, literally, an infection that gets spread through the body can take your life. Now, somewhere along the way, it goes from an annoying little, ow, that hurt, to every time you brush against that something, it's like that hangnail. It's just hypersensitive. It doesn't matter how much you touch it, just a little bump against the back of the chair, reaching for the car keys. And it's more pain than you want to tolerate. It's just a tiny touch. But because of the infection, the nerves are inflamed and everything overreacts to it. But again, if, if you don't deal with that little infection, if you don't get that out of there, if you don't extract the annoyance and prevent the spread of infection, the problem just gets worse and worse and worse and worse, and then it gets in the blood. And here's the scary part. There's this biological transitional phase where the infection might be hypersensitive for a season and everything you bump it against you just ah and then there's a season when you don't feel it at all it's become a hardened layer of skin over the top of the infection we call that a callus and so what you thought was going to be painful like the rest of your life suddenly isn't painful at all but we might in that phase ignore the fact that the infection is still there and it's spreading and, and now it's into the tissues around and now it's working its way into the blood and eventually it could impact the brain or the heart or the lungs in a major life-threatening way but right now for right now it's just a callus for right now I really don't feel anything I don't feel it when I bump it. I don't feel it when I pick things up. It used to be if I just rubbed it against something, it, a cotton ball would make me scream. Now I can carry around cement blocks and it's, I'm good. Let me tell you something. If you've got that kind of injury in your body, in your mind, in your soul, in your spirit, that at one time was so hypersensitive that even a comment about it was more than you could handle. Just a brush in conversation was more than you could handle. But you found yourself in a place where I'm okay with that. You can talk about it all you want to. It doesn't bother me at all. You might be in a place where calluses have started to form on your spirit, on your soul, on your emotions. In such a way that you look at it and say, you know, I'm not deeply concerned about the impact or even the outcome of this little once-ago injury. This once-ago wound that happened in my life, that, that person that did me wrong, that divorce, that death in the family, that loss of a job, that hurricane that wiped away everything that I had. And so the pain becomes numbed, dull, ignored, overlooked, 
forgotten. But is it really gone? No. See, the truth of the matter is, until the issue, which initially caused the pain, is dealt with and removed from your life, you will not be free of the effects of that injury. Until it's actually extracted, forgiven, healed, set free, that problem is coming back. And it may come back at a surface level where suddenly the callus is not enough anymore and the wound begins to hurt again. It may come back in the form of an infection where you see the red streaks coming up your finger and in the back of your hand and you think, well, maybe I ought to see the doctor now. And it may come back in the form of an infection in the blood that takes your life and you wake up on the other side and your family's like, what happened? And it all started with a simple infection that wasn't taken care of. Now, as a leadership coach, you're probably asking the question, what does all this mumbo jumbo about spirits and souls and bodies and infections have to do with me? I am the, the manager of this company. I'm the CEO of this company. I'm a leader. I don't deal with stuff like that. I'm not a doctor. Wrong. <laughs> If you're a leader, you deal with stuff like that. But see, an infection in your organization may not look like a rose thorn stuck in someone's finger or a grass burr in their finger or, or when they reached for the antenna to take their car through the car wash and they snagged that little piece of metal sticking off the side and uh, they got that little rusty scrunch that just itched and itched and itched because they now have tetanus. It may not be that obvious, that simple, that easy to diagnose. It may be that employee who walks into your place of business with a negative attitude every day. And at first, it's the three or four people in their cubicle area or their workstation who are very sensitive to their presence. After a while, they may even become callous to their presence. And over time, you really, you know that at some point, there was a major problem with that individual in that workstation, but it's not manifesting itself right now. Nobody else has whined about it or complained about it in a while, so why bother? If we've gone from, this is an annoyance, this is a, a pestering, festering little problem, to, yeah, we're callous now. Remember what I said about the infection? That's when it's starting to go deep. Now it's starting to get in the blood. See, really the only way you can ignore an infection is to cover it up. You hide the red streaks, you hide the red tissue, you hide the pain, you numb the pain with Tylenol or Advil or anesthetics of some other nature like alcohol, drugs, illicit relationships. And so this person that you hired to manage this small team came in like a thunderstorm and blew everything up. And then all the dust settled and now the calluses have come in and people are like, you know, I really don't like them, but the boss says they're staying. Well, they're staying. And now they're callous to that kind of conversation. They're callous to those negative comments. They're callous to the way that they don't really, that manager doesn't even really have respect for their boss's 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 boss. They kind of see themselves as a miniature king of the world. And they're going to do whatever they want to do. And, and if they get found out, they'll blame it on somebody else. They'll, they'll lie on you so they don't get in trouble. And you may be callous in what's going on right now. You've numbed those feelings. You've ignored that problem. But you've got kryptonite in your house. You, as a leader, have an infection in your team, an infection of attitude, an infection of will, a different vision. I heard someone say, and it makes perfectly good sense, that the prefix di, D-I, means two. It means two. And if you have a die vision, you have two visions. Well, what's the other word we pronounce, die vision, division? It's also the way you take things apart. John Maxwell says all the time that there's a big difference between adding and multiplying, but there's also a big difference between multiplying and dividing. And if you're dividing the company because you're the cancer, you're the infection, you're the kryptonite in this organization's leadership 
opportunities, then you need to do some personal work. But if you're the manager, if you're the leader, if you're the oversight and you see a team that has a problem that's constantly growing and then suddenly stops, hmm, why did all of a sudden that big gigantic problem that caused so much pain and strife and stress last week, why did it go away? Why is it that, that it's no longer a problem? Did they solve that? If they did, I'd like to know how they solved it so perhaps we could solve that problem in other places. But if they've simply buried it, oh, it's not done. Attitudes not dealt with are like duff fires. You've probably never heard of a duff fire, unless you live in Colorado, where they're disastrously well known. See, in places like Colorado and Oregon and, and other mountainside areas, what happens is a fire will sweep through, and sometimes it's a gigantic fire, sometimes it's a small fire. And as the fire sweeps through, it will burn everything on the surface, but it's moving really fast because of the wind. And because of the wind, what we see, the wall of flames, the giant smoke as it passes through, kind of scorches the earth, but it also leaves enough heat. Let's say a fallen tree becomes a coal. Now, I know if you've ever had a fireplace in your home or played around a campfire as a kid, you've seen when the fire went out. But there was that one log that was red hot for hours. I mean, hours. That big hardwood log, you could see the little squares of chunks as the moisture is evaporated out of it and it becomes charcoal. And those coals are red hot and you can feel the warmth from feet away. It's still holding on to its heat. It's festering, it's festering. And what happens in a duff fire is, is that log still holds its heat on the inside, but the winds come along and bury it with other tree limbs and logs. And maybe the winter snow will come down and, and sit on top. And over what could be, look this up, what could be hundreds of years, these old smoldering logs get buried and buried and buried and buried, and they're still trapping their heat. They just ran out of oxygen because you know, they got buried, but they're still trapping their heat. And then a lightning strike or a strong windstorm blows through or a strong snowstorm and it starts to scrape off the surface of what's sitting on top and suddenly this old hot log that's been under the surface for so long <sighs> catches a breath of fresh air. And what happens when you're in front of the fireplace and you have that billowing tool? What happens when you're at the campfire and you blow onto that red hot log? Suddenly, it's all aflame again. The infection that's covered in a callus, the infection that's covered in a callus, the attitude of that person in your organization that's covered in calluses, where everyone has just ignored it to get by. They don't want to deal with this person. They really don't want to confront them or have an argument with them, for heaven's sake. So they just kind of <clears throat> grit their teeth and let it go. That kind of relationship isn't healthy. And like the infection that's sitting beneath the callus but working its way into your bloodstream, like the duff fire that may sit there silent, unknown, for up to a hundred years, suddenly something pierces the surface. Suddenly something breaks through and that conversation we thought was over is alive again. The argument that we thought we'd settled is fresh and new. The anger, the frustration, and everything that goes along with it. <laughs> back into a flame. And what was a fire 100 years ago that burned 20 or 30 acres has had a whole lot of time under the surface to spread. And a duff fire will do that too. It will begin to burn in concentric circles around itself, miles, hundreds of miles of underground fire, burning, smoldering, just waiting, just waiting for oxygen. Well, what do you think happens when that first piece gets air? <clears throat> it begins to burn off the surface. And now not only does it have the heat from below and the oxygen from above, but it has a whole lot of fuel laying on top of it, just waiting to burn. Those are the other people on your team. They are. Those are the people who've all along said, I don't want to have anything to do with this. I'm out of this argument. It's not my problem. 
But now, like matchsticks, they're being consumed, bought up into this problem. Like the infection as it spreads, like the duff fire as it spreads, so will that attitude spread through your organization until the very best of your players are gone. Oh, it happens in the classroom too. It happens in the family as well. It happens in the church. It happens in your small group. It happens in your office. It happens in politics. Anywhere there are humans who can harbor bitterness Anywhere there are relationships that can become contentious. Anywhere that attitude exists, which is, well, anywhere there are humans. There lies the potential of having an under the surface, an underground, a within the bloodstream, out of sight problem that can take over and destroy everything. Kryptonite makes you weak. Infection makes you weak. It draws on the natural resources of your body. The white blood cells go out and fight like little soldiers until they can't fight anymore, and then they just give up, and the bloodstream becomes contaminated, and then the heart becomes contaminated, or the brain becomes contaminated, and what looks like Alzheimer's could set in. What looks like heart disease could set in. Sudden heart attacks, strokes from an infection. Now, there are ways to deal with that. If you've got an infection in your hand or your foot, your finger, your toes, the eyes, the ear, end of your nose, go see your doctor. Get them to remove whatever the offending object is and start some antibiotics and run the course and get that stuff out of your bloodstream before it kills you. But if you're the manager, if you're the leader, if you're the family leader, the small group leader, the church leader, and you've got that kind of infection in your organization, you're the doctor. You need to find that offending substance, person, team, vision. Oh yeah, sometimes a new vision causes the same kind of problem and it smolders like a duff fire and nobody likes the vision and nobody believes in the vision and nobody wants to have anything to do with the vision, but the boss brought it up so we have to do it. But if you're the boss, if you're the manager, if you're the leader of this organization, you have authority and responsibility to deal with that issue, and you should. You should take it upon yourself right now to be busy about the business of finding that offending whatever and extract it. Now, maybe in the case of humans, you can change their vision. You can change their intentions. You can engineer their attitude. That's what Attitude Hack is all about. And if not, Maybe you should liberate them. Let them find another place to be infected or find another place to work, or find another place to hang out. But if you're responsible for your organization, you're responsible for the health of it. And a big portion of that is, what about these underground fires? What about these blood-borne infections? What about this kryptonite? How does it kill and weaken our organization? And how do we get rid of it? If you don't have the answer to that, you probably need a leadership coach. I'll be glad to help or point you to someone who can. Anytime, night or day, send me a private message on Facebook, send me a text message, send me an email. All of my digits are out there. Go to jlaurennorris.com. There's actually a form you can fill out and it'll send it in an email right away. I would love to help see you get rid of the kryptonite, get rid of the infections, the attitudes, the bad players that are destroying the weak destroying the strength and weakening your organization. Now, if you need a doctor, I can recommend a couple of those as well, but I am not one and I don't play one on TV or even on YouTube. I appreciate you watching today. I appreciate the time that you've spent with me and allowing me to spend that time with you. I'm Jay Lauren Norris and you've been watching Tell It Like It Is TV. Have a blessed day.